Good afternoon and welcome to the Promley Fellows Lecture Series uh, with the Strauss Center for International Security and Law at the University of Texas at Austin. My name is Sami Ayoub. Uh, I'm Assistant Professor uh, of Law and Middle Eastern Studies at the University and I'm the academic mentor uh, for the Fellows Lecture uh, today, Ms. Brianna Kaplack. I will start with a few words about the fellowship program at the Strauss Center, and then I'll introduce Brianna to proceed with our event. The Promley uh, Next Generation Fellows Program at the Strauss Center provides research training and mentorship opportunities to exceptional students at the University of Texas at Austin, involving uh, students in international affairs early in their career is an important part of the Strauss Center's mission to prepare the next generation of leaders to help develop solutions to the most pressing public policy challenges. Our fellow uh, today is Brianna Kaplick. She's a master's uh, candidate in global policy studies at the LBJ School of Public Affairs. She specializes in security, law, and diplomacy with interests in, uh, in Middle East security and the US domestic terrorism. As a Promley Fellow, Brianna works with me on domestic tourism law. Now I will uh, have Brianna to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you. Hi all, and thank you for joining today. Um, as Dr. Ayub said, I am a current master's student at the LBJ School of Public Affairs. I study global policy and specifically have been focusing on domestic extremism. Um, today, I'm very happy and excited to um, invite and announce Tess Owen, who is a current senior reporter at Vice News. Um, she'll be joining us for our discussion on extremism in the United States. Tess has a master's in journalism from Columbia University, is originally from the UK, and has been covering these issues at Vice um, since 2015. Um, part of the reason that I wanted to invite Tess to join us today is because I often feel that the real life human experience is often lost at the policy level. Um, with domestic terrorism becoming so mainstream in recent years and particularly since January 6th, I thought this was a great opportunity to invite someone like Tess who has a lot of on the ground insight about these extremist groups and movement. Um, she's here to talk to us about her experience reporting on these issues and the human elements behind these issues so that we can better understand what policies can do to better address them and plan for any unforeseen uh, consequences. So with that in mind, I will open it up to Tess um, to give us a bit of an introduction on her reporting and recent topics. And then we will open it up for questions from the audience. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, so um, when I first started out in journalism, I was covering the Black Lives Matter movement and police brutality. And at the same time, because as general assignment, when you first start out, I was also, um, I wrote about a lot of mass shootings, um, including the 2015 shooting um, at a black church in Charleston by a white supremacist. I was also paying close attention to anti-immigration groups or anti-Muslim groups who were seemingly making inroads um, with mainstream politics and also how their they established ties to um, some top level officials in the Trump administration. I also covered the surge in hate crimes around the 2016 election. Um, and from there, I started tracking as well, the sort of emergence of, I guess, suit and tie white nationalists who were recruiting on college campuses and how they were sort of using rhetoric that had been pushed by these anti-immigrant groups um, and how they were using that to sort of recruit and also um, kind of gain legitimacy in their own way. So Tess, um, I think it would be an interesting point to start with kind of an overview on the, the people that you interact with um, in these extremist movements. So my first question for you is what has surprised you most about the individuals that you've reported on and interviewed um, that are involved in these militia and extremist movements around the country? So I've definitely covered a sort of mixed buffet of um, far right extremists from, again, like I said, the suit and tie white nationalists to the sort of hardcore neo-Nazis who are maybe what you think of or what you used to think of when you thought of, you know, the far right extremists, um, the Proud Boys, um, the Boogaloo Boys, you know, which are the you know, for people who don't know are the anti-government kind of insurgent group who wear Hawaiian shirts and AR-15s. 
than to the more kind of traditional militia groups. Um, and then also, I think probably one of the most troubling, and maybe this is what I found most surprising because it's I found them the most troubling is the intersection between extremism, extremist ideas and mainstream politics. And I think that's, this is what we really saw throughout 2020 with um, the anti-lockdown protests and how kind of the fringe grievances driving some of those protests were being echoed at the highest levels of government um, to some of the language and rhetoric and organizing in response to Black Lives Matter in the summer. And then the Stop the Steal movement, um, which you know brought us up to the January 6th. So I think that seeing that kind of joining of forces between extremists and ordinary people, I guess I found the most troubling. And going off of that, I know that you've been covering these issues for the past um, kind of five to six years at this point. Have you seen kind of the ideological motivations and goals of these individuals? change um, in that time period or have they largely stayed the same throughout uh, the time that you've been reporting on this? So I think Charlottesville was a pretty big turning point because you had these suit and tie white nationalists who are quite optics conscious and they you know aspire for political legitimacy and they realize that the optics of them marching alongside like skinheads and hardcore neo-nazis was bad for what they wanted overall. So I think after Charlottesville, there was this real schism in the movement um, where you had sort of groups like, well, now defunct groups like Identity Europa, who rebranded and got very clever at euphemism. So they were already pretty good at masking their um, very basic racist ideas in more sanitized language, but I think they got even better at doing that partly to avoid social media crackdowns, which came after Charlottesville, um, but also as a way to sort of recover and to, again, gain legitimacy. Um, so there was that happening. And at the same time, I think because big tech, after basically allowing these people to organize um, and share their propaganda and recruit on mainstream platforms, they scrambled to cut ties and deplatform people. So there were also, a, you know, a movement of the kind of more hardcore contingent who then went to sort of Telegram or 8chan um, or Gab, where I think some of those networks became like very like echo chambers for extremely violent ideas that kind of snowballed and, and yeah. And um, coming from sort of the policy perspective of things, a lot of times we look at what communication frameworks exists between um, individuals who have insight and information about these extremist movements and law enforcement who are able to act on this insight. Um, and I had posed this question to you earlier and I'm really interested for you to um, kind of elaborate on it. Uh, what is the role that you've seen law enforcement play with journalists um, as you cover these movements? Are there frameworks that you have to communicate with law enforcement is that something that you tend to avoid? So I think there's different um, sort of different ways to talk about this. So I think, you know, I'm encouraged to, as a reporter, cultivate sources within law enforcement. Um, but that's kind of expected to be more or less a one way street where they're bringing me information. Um, we would not overall cooperate with law enforcement that we're not going to see something online and go and bring that to law enforcement necessarily. I don't know what we would do if we uncovered evidence of like an impending immediate threat. Um, I imagine that maybe we may make an ex exception, but I've never been in that situation. Um, and then on the other side of things is sort of personal safety of journalists. So this has never happened to me specifically, but I know other people who have um, had threats against their safety, against their life, which have had to have been escalated to law enforcement. Um, but overall, uh, we try to, you know, we're not law enforcement and we try to keep as much of a distance from that as possible. As possible. That's really interesting, thanks. Um, so I'd like to turn now to the impact that some of the latest legislative efforts might have on these movements. So there's obviously a lot of discussion around content moderation. Um, one of the biggest topics right now in the news is um, should we or should we not reform Section 230? 
And then I know in your own um, reporting, kind of dating back to your early days at Vice, you've been following gun control and Second Amendment issues. So I'm curious from your perspective, as these legislative efforts kind of ebb and wane over the years, how have you seen them impact these extremist movements on the ground? Um, do you see people becoming more radicalized more quickly? Um, how do you see radicalization, recruitment, um, communication efforts change on different platforms? What does it look like um, from your point of view? So I will say one of the biggest differences, for example, um, post January 6th to post Charlottesville is post Charlottesville when there was this big effort to deplatform these groups or these ideas, um, there wasn't an infrastructure to um, catch them when they landed. So there, there were fewer fringe platforms, fewer fringe host, host, you know, domain providers that could support, um, you know, these people or these these groups somewhere else outside of Facebook or Twitter. Now that's not, you know, now that's not the case. You know, you have an you have Rumble, you have Parler, you have Gab, you have an entire different ecosystem. So I think that's one thing to think about. Um, the other thing I do think is that is it has gotten a bit better in terms of, for example, the YouTube, um, YouTube algorithm. A couple of years ago, um, YouTube was extremely culpable and radicalizing a lot of people because of this, how its algorithm was, you know, if you watched so, you know. An extremist video and then it would just throw up increasingly extreme content for you to keep watching and so you go down these extremist rad uh, rabbit holes um i think now though because there's so many alternative sites that are actually quite sophisticated the problem does run a bit deeper um for example one site that i've relied on quite heavily for my reporting is called my militia and my militia has options where you know there's a chat options there's also an option where it's like you click a button saying form a militia so you build your own militia by zip code there's pdf libraries with bomb making bomb making instructions everything that you could possibly imagine um and it's actually a very sophisticated website on a lot of levels um so i think the fact that those are out there is obviously a problem um yeah Yeah, it's definitely a landscape that's quickly evolving and growing, um, probably weekly. So it's a, it's certainly have a lot of material to cover in your reporting. Um, the last question that I will post to you before we open it up to the Q and A, and just to remind the audience, the Q and A function is at the bottom of your screen, and you can pose a question, which I will read. Um, but I'm curious, what do you think is missing from the kind of policy conversation on the topic of extremism? Um, like I said, I think oftentimes policymakers have a bird's eye view of what's going on, um, which is often missing the more human elements to the conversation. Um, and I'm just curious what you what you think uh, policymakers might be missing from the conversation uh, that should be receiving more attention. I think that one of the biggest, and, and I mentioned it before, um, one of the biggest missing pieces is obviously and rightfully so. There's been so much focus, laser focus on. The roles of known extremist groups um, in January 6th and just participating in political violence overall in the last years or so. But I think that the bigger, more complex problem lies in the middle of extremism and mainstream. Obviously, that's hard for content moderators, it's hard for policymakers, it's hard for the military when they're deciding who, you know, who's radicalized and who's not. Um, and I think that the conversation about that space is also, it's a cultural one as well. It comes down to education and value systems. And those may be harder conversations to have. And they're also thornier because it brings in mainstream politics. And it's hard to have those conversations without seeming like you're pointing fingers. Um, but I think that's one of the biggest missing pieces. I think that the FB, FBI calls them inspired actor. I can't remember the exact term. Um, but people who basically have been radicalized by the last year or the events of the last year or the or the these ideas that have gone mainstream. Great. So I'm going to start to um, pose a few questions that we're getting from the audience. And one of the questions that I've seen from a few different members um, is how do you choose what you're reporting on? So obviously you said that a lot of um, the events that spurred your recent reporting um, are some of the protests that um, started 
last year, there was a lot of um, kind of protests following different uh, mass violent attacks. And people are asking um, if you cover the broad range of um, political uh, protests and violence, or if you cover only specific events along the, the, the extremist spectrum. Um, when I choose to, like, when I choose to cover a specific group or I guess a, a story um, in this on this topic, my I always try to ask myself that there has to be something else that you're saying. You can't just be like, oh, there's this group and it exists. It's like what are the what are the what are the institutions that are enabling this group to exist or to recruit? How are they recruiting? Do they have money? Um, do they have an inroad with mainstream politicians? Um, what are their spheres of influence like? It's not enough to just say, oh, there's a group that exists and they're going out and hanging out on their street corner, you know, once a week with guns. It has to be something more about the power that they have. Um, so that's kind of how I guide my story um, choosing, I guess. Um, yeah. And then a follow up to that one, um, I think, which uh, you and I had discussed earlier was how do you respond to the kind of there are both sides argument, um, you know, meaning there is violence on the left and violence on the right. Why is it that we're often talking about the right? Um, so kind of what's your response to the both sides argument? My response to the both sides argument is that the data doesn't support a both sides approach. Um, and if the data, you know, I don't have the exact numbers with me, but the FBI's own, own numbers about, for example, deaths caused by far right extremists compared to anti-fascists or left wing. I think there's been one um, murder by an anti-fascist in three decades, which, you know, that doesn't mean that that murder isn't worth talking about and, 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 and investigating, but in terms of the urgency with which you create, which you, which you treat one problem, um, I think it just misses the point if you lump it all in together. And I also like to point out as well that the, you know, when people talk about Antifa, I mean, when I'm writing about Antifa, I now talk about Antifa, the conspiracy theory versus anti-fascist, because I think that because Antifa is so decentralized and nebulous, that it's really just a rhetorical, often used as a rhetorical tool and, um, and a boogeyman. Um, to describe something that you don't like. So yeah, I think, you know, if, if, if the data supported the both sides approach, I would, you know, I would go for it. A, Dave and, a data driven approach to journalism. <laughs> um, this next question comes from Alex Rose, who is a current, a current grad student at um, UT, I believe. He says, um, what role do you think that foreign actors have played in stoking the flames of some of this domestic extremism? Or do you think it is mostly just a homegrown thing? Um, so he says, do we even need foreign influence or are we sowing our own divisions? Um, that's a great question. I think that obviously there are disinformation campaigns or bot, or, you know, bot networks that have that are out there and that those have been identified and that those are also responsible for amplifying false narratives. But I think we also have to look at why, why are people so vulnerable? Why is the country so vulnerable to those, to those narratives or to disinformation? And part of it's maybe distrust in institutions or in the government or like, you know, these deep seated anti-government ideas um, that we need to talk about. But I also think that by deflecting and looking overseas is also missing the point. Um, about yeah the, the the very long-standing issues within this country. Um, Ryan McKinney has posed a question about rural extremism, which I know is something that you've been covering a bit as you look at the different Texas militia movements. Um, and Ryan asks, how likely are we to see an increase in rural extremism, especially given federal support for gun control and additional taxes on gas? Great question. And I meant to talk about gun control before, but I, I forgot. Um, I do think that um, experts across the board who've studied the militia movement, for example, have pretty much are in agreement that they expect to see a surge in anti-government or militia activity. And that's partly because, I mean, 
the initial the initial militia movement emerged in the 1990s and that was also coincided with quite significant gun bills including the assault rifle bill and um i think that the the, the militia movement has sort of ebbed and flowed in terms of whether there's a democrat administration or not but i think before biden had even taken office militias were recruiting aggressively around the idea of an impending gun grabbing campaign from the Biden administration. And this is one of my fears because, you know, common sense gun control is something that the Democrats have promised and Biden has promised. Um, but at the same time, I can already see that any movement in that direction is also going to be a recruitment boon for extremist groups or anti government groups. Going off the idea of um, recruitment and kind of a boom in these groups, um, I know that in academia and in research and in journalism a lot, there's the fear of amplifying um, the, the kind of voices and the ideologies of these extremist movements. And Ian Carvel asks, how do you view and approach the issue of amplification with your reporting? Um, so we were talking about this a little bit earlier, but I think that I mean, the extremism, the extremism beat, as we call it, used to be quite niche. Um, and there was probably a handful of us scattered across different outlets. And over the years, I think we've sort of self-policed a little bit and developed a informal code of ethics to sort of guide our reporting on extremism. Um, and it's definitely been a learning curve and I have not always gotten it right. Um, but I think that, yeah, we've tried figure out a way to report on these actors and these topics without inadvertently, yeah, like you say, amplifying their ideas or portraying them in a light that they want to be seen. So for example, I, I remember there was not to call out specific news organizations, but I think there was a CNN interview a couple of years ago where they invited white nationalist Richard Spencer, who helped organize Unite the Right. And he was there as an expert talking about extremism in a suit wearing a, you know, a collared shirt and a tie. And that's how he wanted to be seen was a respectable, legitimate person. So I guess being aware of how, of what they want and how they want to be seen and doing what you can to counter that. And I guess the other thing I'd say is, at least for my reporting, is that typically I don't really care about what they want. I mean, maybe it's useful for me to know, but I don't think I need to print what they want or what they believe in. Um, the most interesting things are what they, you know, how they recruit, do they have money? Um, where are they organizing? What platforms are they using? Um, what inroads they have, that sort of thing. Um, I'm also seeing a few questions here, and this was one of the questions that I had for you as well about um, the trend that we're seeing in terms of security personnel and military personnel um, the kind of fears of insider threats within the government, those with um, information on nuclear weapons systems. Um, there's, there's sort of a, a, a ballooning fear um, of more um, kind of well-connected, well-trained individuals joining these extremist groups. And um, we have some questions about how serious is this risk um, just based on your reporting and the individuals that you've um, interviewed. Um, so I have heard as well that this is one of the sort of biggest concerns um, for DHS is the idea of an insider threat. I think that, um, I mean, we have, through, through my reporting in the recent years, we have exposed a number of active duty military who were involved with neo-Nazi groups or neo-Nazi platforms um, or sort of more you know, or proud boys or white nationalists. I think that, again, um, one of the more concerning, I think that we, those are very concerning in their own ways, but one of the things that I'm seeing now and that I've been reporting on at least are, um, I guess, more informal networks online who operate very much out in the open and are actually hard to pin down ideologically um, because again, they blend the extreme with the mainstream. Um, and they also rely a lot on, on sort of memes and trolling and humor to deflect what they're actually about. You saw that a little bit like with the Boogaloo movement, for example, and Boogaloo's, despite the fact that they are, I mean, ultimately what Boogaloo, the Boogaloo movement wants, 
is a civil war or to overthrow the government, which, you know, you have to wonder why you'd be active duty in the military and also ascribing to an ideology like that. Um, so I think spin-offs from those sorts of groups are really concerning, especially as they get more adept at using language that can help them, you know, skirt uh, social media bans and, and allow them to sort of operate in the open. Um, going off of the, just hold on one second. As I mentioned before, I have a tree being taken down right <laughs> out of my window, so apologies. Um, going off of some of the fears about uh, people involved in these groups, I'm seeing a number of questions about um, issues around mental health in those that are involved in extremism. Um, in your experience, does it appear that um, kind of mental health um, questions and um, that those involved are not as healthy as the general population? Is that something that rings true in your experience? Um, or do you think that that's kind of overstated in some of the reporting and media that we've seen? I think it really depends on what flavor or what kind of extremism you're talking about. Um, if you're talking about the militia movement or the anti-government movement, the traditional militia movement, not like the Boogaloos, um, I think that there is um, such a culture and uh, institutions that sort of support that way of thinking and that way of life. Um, from even just sort of sheriff, some sheriff's departments are very cozy with militia groups, even just the sort of anti-government rhetoric that you see also kind of repeated in by groups like the NRA, for example. But then when you go into like QAnon, for example, I do think that QAnon um, that is a mental health crisis in a lot of ways and that it should be treated as such. And I think that um, that's being increasingly recognized in the way that it's treated in the media. Because I think it's very easy to just treat something like QAnon as like a crazy curiosity, you know? Um, but I don't know if anyone's ever heard of this. Uh, there's, a, there's a subreddit called QAnon Casualties, which um, in which people talk about family members um, or friends who have been brainwashed by QAnon. And it's absolutely heartbreaking, really, really heartbreaking. Um, and I think it also is a very valuable insight into how um, how troubled a lot of people are who fall into this sort of world. Definitely, and I think the the discussion and kind of the nuance that you're teasing out right now about the importance of segmenting extremism. Um, it's not a one size fits all problem, um, and policy shouldn't be a one size fits all solution. Um, and there's a question kind of on that topic from Lillian. Um, Lillian asks, do you believe that there is a way for civil society and U.S. residents to combat extremism, or do you think that it's more of a government responsibility to do so? That's a great question. Um, yeah, I think that there is a way for civil society to combat extremism. I think that one of the, for example, I think I wrote a story a couple of years ago about um, teachers who were putting together a guide for other teachers to learn or to understand whether someone in their you know student in their class was showing signs of being radicalized and it wasn't just you know a kid walking with a swastika on your backpack like it might have used to be in the past but it's actually much more subtle much more nuanced and you have to be familiar with the very specific code languages and and as an ever evolving language as well so it's not that you, like you can just you know read a list of the words that you should be looking out for and be done with it you have to be I mean, this is for content moderators as well as teachers, as well as parents, you have to be constantly kind of engaged with what the latest um, symbols or signs of perhaps being radicalized are. Um, so I think that's part of it. Um, and as far as, you know, just as your, I mean, every day, um, I'm not really sure, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> I think it's something that a lot of us are grappling with right now. Yeah. Um, going off of that as well, we have a question from Nicholas Rasmussen about the, um, the success of prevention frameworks. And um, Nick asks, have you engaged with any former extremists in your reporting and what lessons have you taken away from that? Um, have you seen certain prevention frameworks work? Is it something else that um, helps these people disengage with extremism? What have you experienced? 
So I think that prevention frameworks and de-radicalization programs are extremely valuable and and I think it can be very important to hear from those people who have gone through that process. Uh, but I do think that at the same time, um, and this is partly, uh, this is lawmakers and also media problem as well, is that's the hunger for a redemption uh, story or a redemption narrative has created a space um, in which it's become sort of profitable to be a former extremist. Um, you know, I've seen some cases and I've spoken and spoken to some former extremists who seemingly de-radicalized overnight and before they knew it were, you know, being flown over the country to, 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 to speak at events and getting paid to go on TV. And I think that, you know, that's all well and good, but if you haven't done the work of what it takes to de-radicalize and to seriously reflect on what's on the harm that you've caused and how you got there in the first place, I don't think that you can be a spokesperson for the movement. So yeah, I think balancing, obviously those stories are useful, um, balancing the need for that with also seeing whether they are legitimate and have done the work. It's really interesting and I'm curious, um, you know, kind of within your own personal ethics and journalistic ethics, how do you cover an individual who has seemingly radicalized overnight, but maybe hasn't put in the, you know, the investment to, um, to honestly sort of de-radicalize and change their own ideologies? How do you report on something like that? Um, I mean, I think you let the reader decide, you know, you would say, okay, so this person says they are not anymore, but I mean, I think it depends on how I was co covering it. So if it was just a profile on this person or a profile on the process of de-radicalization, you know, you could let the readers decide whether it was, whether you thought it was working or not. If it was somebody who I, you know, if I just wanted a quick quote, I first wouldn't use them. I think I would just, I, they're not, if they're not an authentic voice for the process of de-radicalization, then it's not helpful. And um, we have a few questions coming in. I think a lot of people are curious as um, an individual reporting on um, some really dangerous and extreme movements. Um, what it, how do you manage your own personal safety? Um, I'm not sure if Vice has certain frameworks in place or if you do anything extra, but a number of people are asking how you manage your own personal safety um, as a reporter. Um, so Vice has an amazing security team. Um, just cannot speak highly enough of them. Um, obviously the freelancers do not have the same luxury of having security like I do. Um, so, I mean, there's my personal security for when I go to events, which increasingly now when I go to cover any kinds of protests, it usually requires a vest of some kind, a helmet and a mask um, and ballistic glasses. I think in, in terms of my sort of my online safety, my personal safety, or my OPSEC, um, you know, they've helped me make sure that all my information is not identifiable. Like you can't find out where I live and everything like that. Um, I've never been doxxed, which is, you know, when people publish your information online and I'm very happy that I haven't been. But one thing that is interesting is that the harassment campaigns that have either been launched against me or other people, they're often very intentional. So they, they, a group of people decided online that they're going to go after a particular person um, and then they go for it. I think a re researcher sent me a screenshot of um, some boogaloos discussing a uh, harassment campaign against me and they decided it would be bad for their optics to be going after a female journalist. Um, but I, I've also wrote a story recently um, involving a bunch of um, sort of boogaloo related network of military people and they activated this sort of troll network against me, but it was obviously very intentional. Um, and I know that you um, are originally from the UK, so you're kind of approaching maybe some of these domestic extremism and specifically Second Amendment issues um, from a bit of an outside perspective. So can you elaborate a little bit on um, how that, how your viewpoint has maybe changed over the past few years of reporting on these topics um, and how those maybe across the pond might see these issues slightly differently? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I did not grow up around anywhere near guns and guns were just not 
anything to do with my life. Um, I don't think I even really saw guns apart from maybe counter-terrorism police at airports. Um, so to go from that to then finding myself at events where I'm like surrounded by people with guns and they at one point so crowded where someone was like knocking me in the head with the barrel of their <laughs> rifle. Um, it's quite a strange transition. Um, I definitely think that's been one of the biggest learning areas for me because um, I was so, I mean, I, I, I think I've come to understand and respect that guns are very important to people in this country. And I'm never gonna fully um, empathize with that necessarily, but I have to have some respect for the fact that they that, that it's just important. Um, so I think that and also be quite normal. I was also at the same time been sort of um, numbed, I guess, as well to being around so many guns, which is also a strange thing. Um, but yeah, I think sometimes I have to, I think I overcorrect sometimes, if, if, if that makes sense, by being too open-minded about guns. I'm like, okay, no, actually this is, this is ridiculous. So I think I have to find kind of a, a line between the two uh, mindsets. Yeah, I was, I was not expecting you to say that you would kind of overcorrect in the other direction, but I guess that's part of the job. <laughs> um, you and I had talked about this a little bit previously as well, but um, in light of a lot of the claims that media tends to lean to the left um, and a lot of the reality of the disinformation campaigns that have been launched um, specifically over the past four or five years, um, do you have any concern about, I guess, these claims that the media tends to lean left and um, if you do, what, what does Vice and you as a reporter at Vice um, do to address those claims? Um, I mean, we have a, dis a dedicated disinformation reporter, um, his name's David Gilbert. He does a very good job and he has a sort of newsletter every morning where he talks about whatever the disinformation topics of the day are. Um, I don't think it's necessarily changed how I do my job because we just, tell the stories that we want to do and we use facts to guide that but in terms of um you know encountering hostility out in the field I mean that happens pretty much that's like par for the course I think on the beat it's not I'm not going places where people love me um but I get a lot of you know oh you're bankrolled by George Soros or you're an Antifa reporter or you know all of that sort of thing um so that's just kind of to be expected and it is frustrating as well when you see people saying, you know, say that they won't read the article because it's from Vice, um, because obviously the people are so divided or people are so sort of deeply entrenched in in their different teams that they can't, they won't, they won't read something for what it is. But um, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers your question. I think it does. Um, and as we near. Uh, the end of the talk, I think I will let you choose whether you want to leave us on an optimistic or a pessimistic note in your answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm curious, so, you know, obviously you've been covering these issues at Vice since 2015. You've seen kind of a lot of the momentum change as different events and different administrations come through. And I'm curious where you think the trend of extremism is heading. Um, are things getting worse? Are people, are more people joining on more dark web platforms or are things getting better? Um, what is your view kind of on where we're heading with this issue? Um, on the positive side of things, I think that one of the biggest problems of the last four years has been the fact that, you know, you had fringe grievances that um, were being echoed by that were being run all the way up the chain to the president. And you had this sort of very dangerous feedback loop um, where when you have elected officials who are echoing the same kind of language that you're hearing that you first heard on 8chan or something, that create, and then in turn that gives them an air of legitimacy, it creates a very dangerous and volatile situation, I think. So now with that, that sort of one top layer cut off now, I think with Trump out of the picture, who I do think was responsible for um, perpetuating some of those, you know, uh, conspiracy theories and dangerous narratives. Um, I think that it's weakened the movement a little bit. However, um, I also think that the amount of disinformation 
and hostility I'm seeing to the Biden administration and specifically like this in response to like gun, you know, gun control or proposed gun control. That's something that really worries me, um, as well as just like ongoing deep political divisions that I don't see getting healed in the immediate future. But um, hopefully everyone will get their vaccine and have a great summer and just, you know, move on. <laughs> Well, I love, I love ending it on an optimistic note. I know oftentimes it can be a very heavy uh, topic. I'm sure it weighs you down to report on it. Um, so I appreciate kind of the optimism. And I think a lot of us are hoping that um, there are some more solutions that can be, that can be found both at the government, civil society um, and individual levels. Um, so I just wanna say thank you so much to Tess first for joining us today. It was really great to hear your insights on the topic and get to pick your brain a little bit about your on the ground experience. Um, and thank you to the Strauss Center and to the audience for joining us and asking great questions. And lastly, thank you to the Strauss Center for hosting this. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great. Thank you.